Welcome to War Games on Toast, all of you lovely people. I am once again back talking about the latest edition of Warcry, and I am once again talking about one of the newest warbands. The last time we spoke about warbands, I was nattering about the wonderful Rockmire Creed, one of my personal favourites. I mean, well, it contains one of my personal favourite models. Uh, but today, I am talking about the Horns of Hushut, a completely different beast. But before we get into all of that, however, I would just like to apologise first and foremost. I have had some technical issues this past week or so, and that's delayed a lot of what I've been wanting to do with the channel. Uh, this video is delayed, which is always a shame, but hopefully things are more stable from now on. Uh, as you can see, it's still not fully fixed. There's no camera that's still having a bit of a, a wobbler. Um, but with working a full-time job, being a dad of two, almost three, and having to write, edit, and record these videos, it takes up a lot of, like, a hefty chunk of time and additional delays, so that just aren't great for anyone involved. And that includes yourself, the viewers. But if you are still here, then thank you for your support. Please remember to leave a comment, like the video, uh, share it with your friends and subscribe. All of these things help fight the YouTube algorithmic demon and that gets more Warcry content into the world. As we all know, Warcry is an amazing game and more content helps grow that community as a whole. And this channel, like this channel as a single entity, has seen fantastic growth and it's been amazing to see. We're already bigger than I thought would ever get. And we're only a few months in. It's all very exciting. But with all of that out of the way, let's get down to business. And as always, it's story time. So who are the Horns of Hushut? Well, they're a band of slave-driving chaos worshippers who have a penchant for destruction. They follow the minor chaos god Hushut, and burning is their entire MO. They were sent to the Gnarlwood to torch it to the ground and loot the remains, but the Gnarlwood has proven a bit too resilient with its gnarl oaks and weird biology. So now they are trundling through the undergrowth and dealing with their foes face to face. Glory to the Bull God, let the flames run white with rage. Quick side note. Hushut is actually not a new god. Heck, it might not even be a god at all. Hushut was mentioned way back when during the days of Warhammer Fantasy and was worshipped by the Chaos Dwarfs. It's often believed, within law, that Hushut might actually just be a demon prince or some sort of greater demon that has managed to amass followers who didn't know any better. And as much as I may or may not, as the video continues, that's, that's spoiler territory there, uh, like the horns of a shirt, I think that making the model range human was a mistake. It would have been very nice to see some Chaos Dwarfs make a return in the setting. So I feel like just from a lore perspective and a model perspective, the horns of a shirt are a bit of a missed opportunity, but you know, what do I know? Um, but anyway, all that concludes story time. If you're still awake, it's time to move on to the pros and cons, the starter to the main course, so to speak, to get a quick overview of what the horns of a shut are good at and what they are trying to accomplish on the battlefield. So we'll start with the pros and the horns of a shut are decently tough. Uh, these guys have a base toughness mostly of 4 and their wounds start at around about 10-12 and go all the way up to 20. Um, the guys are fairly resilient. They're not the most resilient. They've got very few resilience increasing abilities, at least directly direct resilience boosting things. They've got other ways, but yeah, they're decently tough. Not the toughest, but they're definitely not squishy. They also come with solid chaff, and you'll see this in the form of Shatterers, who are very cheap and surprisingly effective on the battlefield. They also have interesting abilities. The Horns of a Shut have some very cool interactions and ways of playing that really f mold their playstyle. And finally, these guys come packaged with a flamethrower. And anything that comes with a flamethrower 
is good in my books. I am very, very happy to see that there's a faction that just has a full-on flamethrower and they use it and it is very good on the battlefield. And then, of course, for every pro, there tends to be a con somewhere in them. And the most obvious and glaring flaw to me as a player is that they have very average movement. This is a similar issue that the Rottmeyer Creed had in that they had nothing that moved faster than four inches. And that's fine. Being average is fine. But when there are, you know, a lot of factions have access to at least one thing that moves faster, you know, like the Stormcast have Griffhounds or or the Beastmen have Sentinel, you know, they're, they're just very average on the move. And this can lead to them being outrun by anything with even a point more movement. And that can be an issue when they're a very melee focused faction, which goes into our next issue is that the Horns of us should have a limited range. They do have their flamethrower. And this has a nice range of six, as you can see on screen now. But that's the only thing with range in this entire faction. Uh, without dipping into additional things elsewhere, you have a range of one inch up to two with a spear-like weapon and then the flame hurler. So fairly average on movement, not much range. This leads to a faction with very limited presence on the board. They can't, well, they can't extend their zone of influence very effectively because there's their influence is so short-ranged. The next con would be that they're very combo and as a result dice dependent and reliant. The Horns of a Shut are have some very powerful abilities and this helps make up for their generally okay stats. To be elevated beyond just being eh, okay, they need these combos to go off and if you just don't have the dice then you can't combo it and it doesn't work. If your opponent plays around it, you're going to struggle. So there's, a, there's definitely a weakness here in the core and that is your dice are so important and this has a knock-on effect that I'll discuss a bit more later on that because you're so dice dependent, the horns of a shut, um, not uniquely, but they do have an issue bringing allies because that further dilutes their dice pool. So it can be difficult to slot them in. And finally, the horns of a shut have very low strength. They are averaging strength three in this box. And then the stronger things get strength four. But strength three is not great. That is below average. Well, it's below the average toughness, which I believe is four. So most of the time, your guys are wounding on fives. And unless you're against super squishy chaff. And that isn't great for a faction that is so aggressive and combat focused. Having a low strength, that's not a good sign. But again, there are ways around this that we will get into. So as you can see, the, the horns of a shut are an interesting bag of tricks. Um, but let's dive into them a little bit closer, a little bit further, and get into the meat and potatoes of the faction. And we're going to start with their abilities and their reactions, and then move on to stats from there. So the reaction that the horns of a shut have access to is called Breath of Cinder and Smoke. This is their bespoke reaction. And before we get into what it does, it, I think it's more important to note who can use it in this case. Most reactions in Warcry can be used by an entire faction, but the Horns of a Shut are one of the few exceptions to this overarching rule of thumb. The reaction requires two rune marks to work, and what this functionally does is remove their chaff from being able to use it. So Shatterers cannot use Breath of Cinder and Smoke. Everything else in the faction can, just not the the basic unarmored slaves who, who don't have access to this. Thematically, this does make sense, and it's very, very important to remember that so you don't, you know, accidentally do a bit of a rules blunder. Now, the reaction does the following. A fighter can make this reaction when an enemy fighter finishes a move action within three inches of them. Roll a dice. If the roll is equal to or greater than the enemy fighter's toughness, Allocate three damage points to that enemy fighter and then subtract one from the strength characteristic of melee attack actions made by the, that enemy fighter until the end of the battle round. This reaction 
on paper sounds pretty darn decent. And that's because it is. The average toughness in Warcry is around about 4, which immediately gives this reaction a 50% chance of popping off, dealing a lot of damage and potentially crippling an enemy. And remember, th 3 damage is a lot. 3 damage is nothing to scoff at when your regular reaction is maybe doing 1 or 2 from a counter, if anything at all. For a reaction, 3 flat damage is very, very nice. This is especially true when you consider the following. Bish, Bash and Bosh. As you can see, a huge chunk of this faction is strength 3 and they don't have many attacks. The average toughness in Warcry is 4, as we just said, so your guys are going to be hitting most enemies on a pretty underwhelming 5. This means you are going to, on average, deal about 2 damage per AP spent when battling. So you have a choice here. You have a, you know, a 33% chance to deal 2 damage per dice rolled, or a 50% chance to deal 3 damage and debuff on a dice rolled. Suddenly this reaction is then starting to look pretty darn good, and that's because it is. In fact, even if an enemy is rocking toughness 5, this reaction is still pretty decent and could be worth burning the AP, since again, your attacks are not likely to land anyway, and against a toughness 5 opponent, it's a 33% chance to land 2 damage, or the 33% chance to land the flat 3. The biggest draw here is the strength reduction, however. Average strength in Warcry is also 4. If you reduce that to 3, then your mostly toughness 4 units are going to be much harder to kill. This is very effective on enemies with strength 5, as you pull them down a peg as well, making them miss more often. Strength 6 enemies are a much harder sell for this, however, so it might be wiser not to use this against super strong and super tough enemies. If they're strength 6, if they're toughness 6, don't do this. If they're toughness 5, if they're strength 5, this is definitely worth doing, uh, but 5 is the upper upper end of this reaction's ability. And you know, finally, there are other ways you can use this reaction, but I will go over them once we get into those abilities. And, you know, speaking of abilities, uh, abilities make a faction in Warcry. They are the beating heart that makes a faction unique. And in most cases, they help form a general game plan for a faction. They are the mould for the situational ideal you want to strive for on the battlefield, and the Horns of a Shut have a very nice selection, despite me putting them loosely in the cons earlier. Now, first off, we have our doubles, and that starts with Merciless Cruelty, and it does the following. The next attack action made by this fighter, this activation, scores a critical hit on a 5 plus if the target fighter already has 5 or more damage points allocated to them before the attack action is made. So this double is very situational. This ability has an amazing first half that is let down by the underwhelming second. Landing critical hits on 5, that's amazing. Especially when you are wounding, when you're hitting most things on 5s anyway because you're low strength. This really boosts the damage of your units from, you know, a, a, across the board 2 to closer to 4 or 5. This is shockingly amazing on Shatterers, as this does include them, boosting them from 1 damage per swing to 4, which is very nice. The restriction, however, hurts this an awful lot. The target must already have suffered 5 damage prior to the attack. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us with an ability that won't see as much use as the first half would imply. Against infantry and chaff, you probably won't bother, as 5 HP lost would imply they're already near death. 
you are not likely going to get much benefit from it as a result. Where this shines, however, is against hyper elite enemies, enemies who are incredibly tough and big monstrous enemies like actual monsters or monstrous infantry or cavalry like Bulgore or Dragon Ogres. These units have way more health than your standard unit, making it far more worthwhile to get easier crit fishing from this ability. Not only that, but enemies with high toughness, in addition, suffer even more now. More often than not, every hit you land will be brutally effective. This makes them good against things like Stormcast, okay? This ability is great in the right situation, but in certain matchups, you might struggle to find a place for it, which is a shame, but there are situations for it. And our second double is Stampede of Iron. This ability can be used by everyone who isn't a Shatterer, and it does the following. Until the end of this fighter's activation, the next time this fighter finishes a move action within one inch of an enemy fighter, pick a visible enemy fighter within one inch and roll a dice. On a four to five, allocate one point of damage to that fighter, and on a six, allocate a number of damage points equal to the value of this ability. This ability, in, in one word, is crap. <laughs> it's just crap. The reason for that statement is because it's too unreliable to burn dice on and the return on that dice investment, even when it pays off, is not very high. You have a 50% chance of doing nothing and the benefit of winning that roll is one damage. And that just sucks. Sure, you have a 1 in 6 chance to land a solid hit providing you burn the high double, but this, this ability just doesn't do enough. In most cases, you'd be better off burning a generic double like Rush or Onslaught to move faster or just gain bonus attacks. Stampede of Iron is really underwhelming. And this leads us to our final double in the roster, and that is called Lay to Waste. This is a double that can only be used by the Ruinator Alpha, and it does the following. A fighter can use this ability only if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them this turn. This fighter makes a bonus move action or a bonus attack action. This is a very generic ability that you will find scattered amongst many factions in Warcry and it's also a very good one depending on the faction in question. The Horns of a Shud can use this to great effect in the right circumstances. Ruinator Alphas are the strongest units we have access to. They have the most attacks, the highest damage, the highest strength, which makes this an ideal, which makes them an ideal candidate for this ability. However, just because they're the best in our faction doesn't mean they are great when compared to other factions. In fact, the Runa Alpha are decidedly average when compared to elite fighters in other warbands. This means you are going to need to put a bit of extra work into getting this to pay off. In general, however, it's always worth putting that effort in. Using your weaker units to whittle down an enemy so your bulky boy can get in there and deal that final blow and then get a free move or free attack action is a great way to increase your presence on the board or to increase the damage you can do per turn. This ability is very strong, just be prepared to pull some strings to get it to pop off. Considering our other doubles are far more situational or straight up bad, this one is probably the one that you want to invest doubles into, providing you aren't already burning those doubles on generic abilities, which again could be the way to go here. Okay, so now we move on to our triples, and I'm going to say this right now. These abilities are the ones that make the horns of her shut. The doubles, pretty generic, pretty bland, let's be honest. The triples... This, this is where the horns shine. You will find that if you don't have a triple in hand, your turn is harmed as you can't operate as a true horns player without them. We start with my favourite ability in the entire warband and one of my favourites in all of Warcry purely for the destruction it can cause 
and of course we are talking about the engulfing flames of dark artifice. This ability does the following. Pick a visible enemy fighter within 6 inches of this fighter and roll a number of dice equal to the value of this ability. For each 4 plus, allocate 3 damage points to that fighter. Do the same for each other visible enemy fighter within 2 inches of that fighter, but instead roll a number of dice equal to half the value of this ability rounding up. Okay, this ability is amazing, providing you have a high triple. Now, I'm talking about a 506 here, okay? 506 is what you want to go for. With a high triple, which is what we're going to assume you have from now on, this ability can destroy an enemy's lines. With six dice, you're averaging nine damage to the thing that you targeted first. This is enough to kill some models, and more than enough to cripple just about every single infantry model in the entire game, including in including leaders. This ignores toughness. It ignores most things. It's just a 4 plus and you deal damage with 6 dice, that's 9 on average, with 12 being a lovely lucky roll that will kill even the burliest of frontline infantry and chaff. The spread is where things get even nicer. Enemies within 2 inches take damage as well, and again with a high triple, you're averaging 3 to 6 damage per enemy, spiking at 9. Spiking 9 damage on things nearby. The damage you can do in a single use of this ability is mind-blowingly high. Is it situational? Yes. You have to line up the perfect shot and your flame hurler has to be nearby and you have to have a high triple and the enemy has to mistakenly clump up. But when it works, my god, the devastation is immense. I have killed so many things with a lucky flame hurler just melting entire blobs of chaff, entire battle groups have been destroyed with this ability before because they walked on and weren't expecting the flame hurler to be standing right next to them and melting each and every one of them. Even when you don't get a great spread, it will still deal huge damage to one enemy, and sometimes that's all you want. The 6 inch range is very nice too, and you can even use it in combat and fire it into combat. It is, it is in and of itself not a ranged attack, so you can just burn people in combat. And it's amazing, because in combat people tend to clump up more, and that means you can get the perfect engulfing flames of dark artifice pop off, and it's just beautiful. This ability shines when enemies just mess up. You know, um, you know they could deploy on the board wrong, or they're trying to secure objectives and they, you know, they clump up too much. Get these things will naturally clump them together due to restrictions, and this is a very very nice scenario to be in when you have your flame hurler preemptively in position and ready to burn them alive. What's more, targeting a bigger based model will drastically increase the range of this attack. So have fun with that little tidbit there. Amazing ability and the reason you take the flame hurler. Okay, amazing. And our second and final triple is Ash Bomb. And whilst not as flashy as engulfing flames of dark artifice, it does a lot of work behind the scenes and it makes the horns of a shut sing in their chosen form of combat, which we'll get into more in a little bit, okay? Ash Bomb does the following. Pick a visible point within 6 inches of this fighter, okay, on the battlefield floor or platform and then place a token there. That token is an ash bomb token. While an enemy fighter is within three inches of any ash bomb tokens, subtract one from their toughness and subtract one from the attack characteristic of attack actions made by them, both to a minimum of one. At the end of the battle round, you remove the token. Okay, so this ability can actually be game changing. Uh, this ability is that strong. It is a game changingly powerful ability in the right circumstance. Everything wrong with the horns of a shut is fixed right here temporarily in a small area, okay? Minus one toughness and minus one attack 
is huge. This makes up for your faction's low strength. It allows you to tank more effectively because you're neutering their offensive. It allows you to stand on objectives and secure them with a staggering level of reliability. Not only that, but remember what I said about the reaction earlier, okay? About how abilities can play into this. Yeah, that, okay? Ash bombs make the reaction even better. Let's just compile the list of amazing benefits Ash Bomb and Breath and Cinder of Smoke do when combined. Minus one attack, minus one toughness, minus one strength, minus three HP. Okay, you are going to gut their offensive stats, making them sh shockingly susceptible to your very potent reaction, and as a result, slashing their offensive even more and dealing damage. You can then go in and land reliable melee damage. You throw this in front of your warband and enemies are going to have a bad time. Very few enemies in Warcry can suffer that many debuffs and are still able to operate with a degree of reliability. Ash Bomb is so easy to overlook because engulfing flames of dark artifice exists and it's so much more flashy. But I would argue that Ash Bomb is just as good, if not even better in the right circumstances. As a general rule of thumb, I would usually use a high triple on engulfing flames. Anything lower than four would go in ash bomb. Even then, it's all situational. Analyze the board state and use the best ability for the job. If you can get two triples in one turn, then you are at peak horns of a shut levels of power. And that turn should be a turn you push every single advantage you can because the odds of you getting another turn in that game with that many powerful triples in play at once, they ain't going to happen again, okay? And do remember as well, you can throw two Ash Bombs in one turn if you have two triples, okay? And whilst the effects don't stack, you can use the two Ash Bombs to make a larger wall of Ash Bomb token coverage, making it much harder for enemies to mess with you. You essentially make a wall of ash and then he has to then decide do they walk into it to get debuffed or do they wait till it, burn, it goes away and that could also win you the game. It forces difficult decisions for your opponent and that's always a good thing. And you know with all that out of the way let's move on to our final ability and this is the quad unleash the raging Taurus. It does the following. This fighter makes a bonus melee attack action. In addition Add 1 to the damage points allocated by each critical hit scored from that bonus attack action. This ability can be used by Ruinators and Ruinator Alphas. And frankly, it sucks. It really, really sucks. For a quad, I would rate this as being worse in most cases when compared to the generic Rampage quad that you can find in the core book. Not only that, I would say that this quad is worse than most triples. I would honestly just forget that this exists most of the time. It is an expensive waste of time. But with all of the meat out of the way, let's look at our warriors and just see how stocky they are in our horns of a shut soup. And we're going to start with the Ruinier Alpha. This bad boy comes in two forms, Bident or Heavy Flail. I think there is only one worth bringing, and that is the Heavy Flail. Looking at their stats, plus one attack is nearly always going to do more, da do more for you than plus one crit, unless you are using Unleashed the Raging Taurus, which honestly, you shouldn't be. So that's a completely moot and nullified point. So comparisons of weapons aside, let's look at the generic stats and assume everything else is Heavy Flail. You have a solid defense for a model of this cost. 20 wounds, toughness 4, movement 4, at 165 points. This will keep you alive and kicking against most chaff, but you are going to be in danger of being taken out by a dedicated assassination run. You're solid, but you are nothing to write home about here unless you are getting buffed or debuffing things with your various abilities and reactions. This goes for your attack stats too. The Alpha has 4 attacks, strength 4, 2-4 damage at a range of 2 inches. This is all solid and it fits the price of the model. You'll be able to deal with most infantry and chaff, no bother, but again you're going to struggle against better units in Warcry. 
just because this is your leader doesn't mean he won't get clapped by a basic stormcast in a duel. And then this takes us to our Ruinator. This guy is basically just another Ruinator Alpha in most ways and operates as a beat stick in the faction, at least when compared to most other things. Ruinators have movement 4, toughness 4 and 15 wounds and they roll in 125 points. This defensive line is pretty great actually. You're paying a premium for them but he does well here. Being 40 points cheaper than the Alpha really helps this guy out. Attack wise, this is where things take a bit more of a dip, a bit more noticeable dip. He comes with 4 attacks, strength 4, 2 4, damage like the Alpha. However, the Ruinator only has a range of 1 inch. This makes it a little harder to get the Ruinator stuck in, and he is noticeably more susceptible to spears. However, 4 attacks at a strength 4 is a very nice profile and can do work. You can fish for crits with the stat line and this makes him an ideal target for merciless cruelty as a result. So that's the end of our like, more elite things. So the Ruinator Alpha is the leader and the Ruinator is sort of like a leader in waiting <laughs> basically. But now we go on to the, the core of the, the horns of a shut and these are the demolishers and these come in three variants. And firstly, we are going to talk about the Demolisher with Crushing Weapons. This guy is very interesting, okay? He comes in with Movement 4, Toughness 4, 12 Wounds, and 105 points. This, again, is very solid for the points cost, okay? Defensively, they are very comparable to the Ruinator and get a very nice reduction in points for a very small reduction in defensive capability. Offensively, this is where they get a bit shady, however. 4 attacks, strength 3, 2 4 damage, and range 1. These are crit fishing monsters on the battlefield. Sure, they are weaker than Ruinators, but with the same number of attacks, a very comparable defensive line, and the same damage profile, these guys can do a lot of work when luck is on their side. These are actually great to throw as a way of like berserker kind of units like just throw them into a scrap and pray to the dice gods these are actually amazing when you throw on something like onslaught this boost their attacks to five attacks per ap or 10 attacks if you're stationary and that is huge that is looking at a fairly reliable chance to land you know eight damage 12 damage and that is lethal levels of damage very very solid these are just, you run them in and they just go to town, you know. They might do nothing because they're low strength and, you know, you're relying on those sixes. But when it pops off, boy, do these guys pop off. These are also fantastic as well with Merciless Cruelty. Again, because they're wounding most things on fives anyway. So it might as well boost their damage to four with every hit and have fun. And yeah, very, very nice. Very, very nice. And the next kind of Demolisher is the Demolisher with Crushing Weapon and Shield. Now, I used to be really into these guys, but the more I play the Horns of a Shut, the less I actually like them. These guys have an excellent defensive profile, coming in at Movement 4, Toughness 5, and 12 Wounds. That Toughness 5 can really keep your boys alive, but the trade-off is in offensive stats. Three attacks... Strength 3, 2 4 damage, range 1. These guys are much better holding the line, but that minus 1 attack really eats into their damage potential. I find the Horns of a Shut to be a defensively orientated faction because of Ash Bomb and their reaction. However, they still rely on their offensive to capitalize on both Ash Bomb and their reaction. So that minus one attack really hits hard and I don't think that plus one toughness makes up for it. Because of this, I like them, but I don't think they are as useful in the grand scheme as their twin crusher weaponed cousins, which is not something I thought I would say since I am typically a huge fan of shields in Warcry. I just don't think they fit well in the Horns of a Shut when you look at them as a complete package, which is a bit of a shame. And now we move on to the final Demolisher, and it's the one we've all been waiting for. It is the Demolisher 
with Flame Hurler. This is my favourite unit, but I would preface this by saying you only ever want one, one of these in a warband. Their ability is excellent, but you won't have the dice economy to support two Flame Hurlers. As a result, keep this guy safe and you will be fine. But on to stats. Defensively, this guy is a demolisher, okay? So he's moving for toughness for 12 wounds. Very nice. He comes with a bit of a bump in points, rolling in at 125 points. But this is expected, and I would say it is well worth that 20 point bump. Offensively, he has two profiles the Flamer and his fist. The Flamer has a range of 6 inches with no minimum range, 3 attacks, strength 5. 1, 5 damage. This thing is very reliable. Very, very reliable. The range is nice, the strength is nice, and sure it lacks minimum damage, but with 6 attacks when stationary, you are looking at about 7-ish damage on average against most enemies. This is very nice, especially when you do consider engulfing flames, which could average, you know, 9 damage additional damage to that same target so bringing that to a whopping you know 16 damage on average in most cases and that is a nasty burn to take now it's important to remember that this attack has no minimum range now from my understanding and i have checked the rules here but uh, i couldn't say anything so correct me if i'm wrong and point to the section so i can check myself you can fire this in melee it is a ranged weapon but I don't think that actually matters in this instance as the lack of minimum range means you can just blast away anyway. You just have some restrictions on who you can target as per usual. If something is within one inches, you have to fire at that. You can't fire at a guy that's, you know, a bit further away. Despite that, you don't want this guy anywhere near combat. He is much safer hanging back and flaming from a safe distance, okay? And now we move on to our final unit, and this is the Shatterers. These are the unfortunate chaff units of our faction, and they do their job very, very well. They come with movement 4, toughness 3, 10 wounds, 10, for 55 points. This defensive line is very solid. Wounds 10 in particular is very nice, as it makes them a little bit harder to shift than your standard wound 8 model that tends to exist in this price bracket. Offensively, they're very solid too, coming with 3 attacks, strength 3, and 1 4 damage in a range of 2 inches. This is pretty darn close to your demolishers in terms of, def of, in terms of offensive potential, and the added benefit of range goes a long way to make them a pain to deal with. You get five in the box, and that is the perfect number of shatterers uh, to run. Five is a wonderful number, and that is a lot of chaff you can just throw in front of people and just do work with. Very, very nice. So before we get onto our list of recommendations, let's quickly just touch on the conclusion. Overall, I love the horns of a shut. No individual model, bar the flamer I guess, is outstanding, but when taken as a whole, they are very solid on the table, and their abilities, especially their triples, can elevate them to much higher heights than their relatively low cost and high model count would suggest. My biggest criticism is when I leveled at the Chaos Legionnaires. They are overly dice dependent. The horns of a shut need dice to work, and those dice need to be triples to really pop off. If you aren't getting great rolls, you're going to struggle. What's more, this dependence on dice makes it surprisingly difficult to slot in allies as they dilute the dice pool even more. Once all is said and done, you have a very interesting faction here that wants to get into combat, lure enemies into traps, and strike with the force of a particularly buff blacksmith. They love to hold key objectives, they love choke points, and when they work, they are a nasty threat to deal with. Very, very fun once you get the hang of them. Now, I promised a list, and I have a list raring to go. So you want to bring the following. A Ruinator Alpha, a Ruinator, four Demolishers with paired weapons, one Demolisher, 
with a flame healer and five shatterers. This will get you a wonderfully aggressive list that has everything you need. You have chaff to just bog people down. You have the berserk-like demolishers with paired weapons to just crit fish and mince things. You have ruinators and alphas to do the heavy lifting if you need to. We've got the flame hurler to just mince things. But just be aware, you still... Just because you're a very aggressively focused list doesn't mean you ha you can just run in guns blazing. You need to think, you need to prepare, you need to ash bomb. Okay, with ash bomb, this list goes from being a okay list that can kill things sometimes to being a devastating list that will absolutely murder everything. So yeah, okay, plan it. But the list is solid. You can get this all from the, the starter box too. It's great. You could consider dropping one of the paired weapon demolishers for a demolisher with weapon and shield. And this can work too. That extra toughness you can use to grab objectives. Or you can use that to uh, hold people up, you know, join the chaff horde and just be a particularly tough and tricky to deal with chaff because toughness 5 is nice. So you could consider that as well, going with the three paired and the one shield. And that is the end of the video. That's all I have for you today. If you made it this far, thank you, you absolute legend. Please be sure to drop a comment, leave a like, share and subscribe. If I got anything wrong, please let me know. If you have some insight on how to play them, then please leave a comment so others can read and absorb your knowledge. Let's get the horns of a shut to a new level of tactical mastery. Anyway, thanks for watching. Next up is the Scions of Flame. Ta-ra!